This screencast is on aggregate demand. We're going to look at the three reasons why the aggregate demand curve looks like it does, and then we're going to also look at the determinants that shift the aggregate demand curve. So first off, remember that the aggregate demand curve is not uh, downward sloping because of the income and substitution effect, like we would say for the regular demand curve. I think the one to watch out for is the income effect, because if anything, that's the one that you may confuse as you're describing the aggregate demand curve. So be careful of that one. So when we talk about the, the aggregate demand curve, remember that when we're talking about how to label the different axes, you have real GDP along the horizontal and price level along the vertical. When you are labeling the aggregate demand curve, you have to, for test, put the formula for GDP, the C plus I subscript G plus G plus XN. Um, on test, you will be marked down if you don't have all of this labeling on there. And this is really important because these are the determinants that affect the um, aggregate demand curve. And so by you being able to apply them, that'll help you with the shifting because in the FRQs you're expected to always indicate which component of GDP is changing. So when we talk about the three reasons of why the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping, the first one is the wealth effect, which is also known as the real balance effect. Um, the wealth effect gets used more than the real balance effect. But it's really important for you when you're talking about aggregate demand, especially for these first two reasons, to really connect it with the purchasing power of consumers. The wealth effect is about the component of C, that consumption, when we talk about GDP. So what happens here is that when the price level of goods goes up, the purchasing power, the amount that people have to spend, is, goes down because things cost more. But we're not talking about it's because of somebody's income. We're talking about the purchasing powers of the assets. Think of like savings, for example. That's a really commonly used example of an asset that people would consider when they're looking at how they're going to be able to purchase all of the final goods and services. And so if you had $1,000 in your savings and the price level of goods goes up, then you aren't going to be able to buy as many goods with that $1,000 as you could before. So the aggregate, when we talk about which component of GDP does the wealth effect deal with, that one is about consumption. The next one is the interest rate effect. And with this one here, we're not talking about the interest rate changing. We're talking about, again, the price level of goods changing. And what happens here is that when the price level of goods changes, in order for people to be able to buy them, whether it be for personal consumption or for investment, people have to take out loans. And think of that investment demand curve. When the investment demand curve is like the aggregate demand curve where it's downward sloping, and that's where you're dealing with the demand for loanable funds and um, when people need to take out loans, then their demand for money or loanable funds is going to go up, which is going to cause the interest rate to go up, which then means that it's going to become more expensive to be able to purchase things because loans are going to be more expensive. So again, the purchasing power is going to go down. This time, it's not about how their savings, like we had with the wealth effect, where their savings can't buy as many things. It's about how they have to take a loan out for more money, which is going to cause an increase in the interest rate, which ultimately then will not allow them to be able to buy as many goods. So when you're thinking about the interest rate effect, it's because of a change in the price level of goods that people are going to demand more money. When people demand more money, that causes the interest rate to go up, and then as a result, the aggregate expenditures are going to go down. The last one that we have here is the foreign purchases effect. And this again is about how when U.S. goods change in their price level, then that relative to foreign goods, that will cause people to either want to buy more or less of the U.S. goods. 
So if our price levels fall, well then that means that more people will want to buy the U.S. goods and that will have an increase in the aggregate demand for the U.S. exports. It has nothing to do with people and their um, changing their habits or anything like that. It's simply about the price level change of our goods relative to other goods. A way that that's talked about sometimes is about like the appreciation of the dollar. And when the dollar appreciates, it then costs um, more of the foreign goods, foreign um, currency, in order to be able to purchase that one dollar of, um, of U.S. goods. And so as a result, then, they can't buy as many. So in that case there, when our dollar appreciates, then you have a reduction in the aggregate demand. So those are the three reasons why the demand curve is downward sloping. And now we need to think about um, different components that will shift the aggregate demand curve. Again, when we're looking at this here, you would have the ag aggregate demand equals C plus I subscript G plus G plus XN. And with that, when you're looking at any questions about it where you're shifting it, it's not talking about a change in the price level of the goods, it's the inflation or deflation. Rather, this is talking about a change that is happening. You need, the first thing you need to do is think about what component of C plus IG um, plus XN plus G is going to affect it. So in this case here, when you have consumer confidence, meaning that people just don't feel like they are going to be able to afford things maybe in the future, or they're not believing in the way things are going now, as a result then their consumption is going to decrease. And when that happens, you have a decrease in the aggregate demand, which decreases that real GDP, which is marked with a Y in this case, and that also will decrease the price. The aggregate supply curve for now, as you can see, is upward sloping. Um, the other thing to look at is about unemployment, because the two things that we really look at here are inflation and unemployment, about what it is that we can do to try to solve problems with fiscal and monetary policy. And so in this case here, we're just going to be looking at unemployment. And when less goods are produced, more people become unemployed. So this next one here is about what happens if taxes are cut. Taxes is not a component of G, of that C plus I subscript G plus G. It's not a part of that G. But rather, taxes are what affect people's disposable income. And so if taxes go down, that means that people's disposable income goes up. That's the income after taxes, the amount that they can spend. This is a very important term in like purchasing power, one that you want to really start using when you're writing your FRQs. And so when you have the disposable income goes up, that means that the consumption is going to go up. And so again, you have this time aggregate demand going up and ultimately unemployment goes down. When we talk about nominal interest rates, uh, remember that was referred to back when we were talking about that interest rate effect. And that's the um, interest rate that people are taking, maybe to buy um, a house or maybe, or maybe a car is a better one, you know, like big ticket items, things that are dealing with the consumption aspect. So for the nominal interest rate, this is dealing with people, and so their consumption is going to go down because they are going to have to increase their demand for loans, which is ultimately going to have to um, cause the uh, aggregate demand to go down and unemployment to go up. The difference is the real interest rate. The real interest rate is dealing with businesses, with banks, and the loans that they are giving out. And so that real interest rate, if that one goes down, that means that firms will be able to increase their capital stock. Become familiar with capital stock. That's an important term as a way of talking about like capital goods. Um, and so with that, though, that would be like the equipment and the machinery. With that, this is an, a component of um, investment. And so investment is going to go up, which causes aggregate demand to go up, and as a result, unemployment will go down. In this case here, what's different about this one and the interest rate effect is that the interest rate effect is that movement along the aggregate demand curve, and that was because of a change in the price level. 
and how when the price level changed, that then caused people to go out and get a loan, which then made things the interest rate go up. In this case here, there's no price level change. It's just an interest rate change. And so that's why it's a shift of the aggregate demand curve. Um, so here's an example where we talk about how the dollar appreciates. And when, again, when, it, when the dollar appreciates, that means that it costs more um, U.S. dollars in order to be able to buy one currency of another, from another country. And so as a result, then, that other country can't buy as many of our goods. So when our dollar appreciates, that means that the aggregate demand goes down because it causes our goods to become more expensive relative to other nations. Um, and so that component there of XN is the one that you will see uh, will decrease it. And so these are just different aspects of things that will shift it. The C, I, G, X, N. Think of ones that you can practice with or ones that might be asked. Capital stock is a really good one to get in your head because that deals with the investment.